this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high-quality racing oil for your two-stroke or four, make sure you go to Blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. This is Hannah. This is Bailey. This is Reagan. This is Butters. <laughs> Welcome to the Motocross Vault. Welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at the history of Honda's open class two stroke machines. Uh, the first Honda open classer production wise was 1981, the all new CR 450, and Honda would continue in production with the 500s until 2001 when it would retire it in favor of the all new CRF uh, 450 machine I had uh, and quite liked. Um, the two stroke Hondas, they were actually the latest of the Japanese to get involved. They didn't, as I said, have an open class two stroke until 1981, well after the other Japanese machines. The, uh, by that point, you had the RM370, you had the YZ360, YZ400. Um, Kawasaki was producing an open class or early on, although they kind of took a break there in the late 70s where they focused on the 125s and the 250s, very much like Honda. Uh, but in 1981, they came out with a production CR450, a machine that came out to a huge amount of fanfare. Honda had been very successful in the Racing in spite of not having a 500 production bike, they had works bikes that people like Brad Lackey and Roger DeCosta were racing in Europe. Uh, pretty much the coolest, trickest machines in the class. Uh, but they had held off on actually producing a production machine. Open class bikes in Japan in the home country, they're pretty much done, didn't exist. They they didn't really race them uh, over there. It seems like they focused more on the 250s and 125s. I guess the, maybe the Japanese tracks weren't suitable for 500s, and of course, uh, Japanese people in general will be sh shorter, lighter, smaller. So maybe the 500s weren't as appealing. But if you look at some of my old classic brochures, they don't even have 500s in them. It's like they didn't even exist. So. I think in the home market, it wasn't really a priority in Japan. But in Europe, the 500s were king through the 70s and most of the 80s. Uh, by the 1990s, the 500 class really had kind of lost a lot of its prestige. Eventually, they would move on to four strokes. And now we all, everybody races 500s, essentially. The, the modern 450 is nothing but a 500 with a little you know, easier to manage power. Uh, but certainly through the 80s and 70s, the 500s were considered the premier bikes. Honda, as I said, came in in 81. Uh, the bike was not great at the beginning, uh, really got really good within a couple of years. And through the mid-80s, they were probably one of the best 500s. In the 90s, the CR was one of the last Japanese, that, Kawasaki and Honda were the last of the Japanese really making 500s. Uh, at that point, again, it was already starting to transition maybe to four strokes. And then by the late 90s, you know, you had the YZ400 come out. And that really was the um, the death knell, the nail in the coffin for the 500 class, more or less. When the four strokes really took off, once Yamaha came out, it was only a few years before Honda discontinued them. But this video is going to cover a look back at what Honda did each year. This is going to be a broad strokes overview, very much like I've done uh, with the CR250. Uh, and you can find, I'll put a link to here, here in the channel as well. I did a, a couple of uh, couple of videos on that showing the CR250. I'm just going to do exactly like that. Go year by year, talk a little bit about what they did each year. Maybe a broad strokes overview of whether the bike was you know successful or not, but I'm not going to get into too in depth. Uh, if you want to find a little more in depth on individual models, uh, check out some of the other videos I've uh, done individual in depth looks at other CRs, uh, 500s, and what have you on the channel. Uh, this is just going to be like a little bit of a overview of each year. I'm not going to get into too much detail. If you'd like to support what I do here at the Motocross Vault, I do have Motocross Vault merch available. I have uh, several open bike styles from Honda, Yamaha, and Kawasaki. I did one based on one of my favorite CR 500s, actually CR 480, the 83 480. I have a bike I had two of. Really love that machine. I also did one somebody asked me to do based on a works bike, and I took uh, Dave Thorpe's uh, factory Honda, the RC500, and one of the coolest, trickest machines ever. And I did a version of a shirt based on that as well. So you can get shirts, stickers, posters, what have you, on my Teespring store. I'll put a link in the description below, and I certainly appreciate the support. Uh, so here, without further ado, is a look back at the history of Honda's open class two strokes from 1981 through 2001. Honda's 500 class adventure starts here in 1981 with the all new CR450R. Now, as I said in the intro, this is the first year for Honda's open class machine, a very, very anticipated bike at the time. Now, Honda in 81 did not quite have the reputation they would enjoy, you know, five or six years later. Uh, they had had some really up and down machines in the 70s. Of course, they started out gangbusters with the first CR125M and CR250M in uh, 1973 and 74, but the mid-70s had been full of some pretty lackluster, you know, bikes that were basically retreads and getting uh, waxed by the Suzukis and Yamahas at the time. In 78, they'd come out with an all-new CR250 R Elsinore, the first one to have the R designation on it, which stood for a works replica. This 81 machine was all new from the ground up and a major departure in so many ways. I think Honda... 
Uh, they really swung for the fences this year and probably overreached in some ways. This is the first year for the ProLink rear suspension, their uh, monoshock in the back with a rising rate linkage system. Now, this had been used on their works machines, but this was the first year they put it into production. Uh, in the 125 and 250, they also added liquid cooling here in 81, and they went with a lot of... Uh, a lot of departures. This bike was completely new, as I said. has a uh, tough chromoly steel frame, 41mm uh, leading axle forks, putting out 12 inches of travel. Uh, in the rear, the ProLink put out 12.3 uh, inches of travel. This bike also, of course, features an all-new motor, which was based on the smaller uh, CR250 engine. This wasn't a motor designed from the ground up to be a, an open-class bike. It's actually kind of an overboard 250, more or less, uh, at 431 cc's. Uh, you know, it's kind of what you would consider like a mid-size uh, open-classer. And the machine ran very much like a big 250. The power band was uh, narrow, wasn't particularly easy to ride. It also came with a four-speed transmission. Most people at the time did not care much for the ratios of the four-speed, thought it kind of limited the, uh, the functionality of the bike on the track. Uh, suspension was not very good either. This those 41 millimeter forks were fairly decent size for the time. You know, some some uh, manufacturers were getting ready to go to 43s, but 41 was considered uh, pretty standard in 1981. Uh, but their performance was only mediocre. Uh, the ProLink rear, uh, most of the magazines from reading back on them thought the the ratio wasn't quite right on the thing, and the uh, action wasn't smooth all the way through its travel. Uh, there was some things to like about the bike, the dual leading shoe front brake was kind of the, the class standard in 1981. It offered, obviously, nobody had disc brakes in 1981, but uh, these dual leading shoes it would basically press against the drum from two sides at once and would give you a little more power than the standard uh, single leading shoe brake would. The bike handled decently enough. I, you know, At the time, there were some reliability issues. I think the most people complained with the bike was uh, the motor was just difficult to ride. The clutch wasn't very good. It tended to drag. Uh, the transmission transmission ratios were off. And if you look back at Honda, this is definitely not one of their proudest years. Uh, the 250, the 125, the 450, none of them were particularly good in 1981. But it was important that it showed at least Honda was willing to produce a bike in the open class. Uh, so although this first 81 is uh, unique and interesting to look at, its performance on the track left a lot to be desired. After the poor reviews the CR450 had received in 1981, Honda went back to the drawing board in 1982. Uh, this is an interesting year for Honda because this is the time when Roger DeCoster had come on board as a uh, consultant and a test rider. He had just retired. In 81, it had been a little late to make much of an impact with the production machines. But in 82 and 83, you really start to see the man's influence on the production side of Honda's bikes. And they got much better. Here in 82, uh, you see an upsizing of the motor from 431 cc's to 472 uh, you also get a completely different power band, uh, where the 81 was kind of peaky and top-end focused, as I said, more like an overboard 250. Uh, this 82 model has a much chunkier, torquier style of power. It runs much more like a Mako, which was kind of the uh, the gold standard of 500 class power at the time. It's a real low to mid uh, torque monster and much, much uh, better on the track, I would say, by most people's standards than the PK81. Uh, you also get a upsizing of the forks here. You go from a 41 millimeter to a 43 millimeter fork, which were considered, uh, as the brochure says, massive in 1982. We got all new ProLink ratios here for 1982. Uh, they revised the damping on the shock as well. Uh, the four-speed transmission continues, which was, uh, you know, fine for motocross use. Um, although even at motocross, I think a lot of people would prefer a five-speed, but it was decent enough for that. But it definitely limited the bike's appeal off-road. Um, there's used a 38 millimeter carburetor. You had all new uh, plastic as well. Uh, it doesn't look a whole lot different than 1981, but you did lose the hideous hangnail front. A number plate that had been, you know, quite a bit of ridicule <laughs> on the 81 machines made them uh, look quite bizarre. Interestingly, only the American uh, bikes got that uh, number plate. It seemed like the ones bound for Europe and Japan didn't have it, so I don't know why we got lucky with that goofy thing. Uh, some of the American Honda must have thought it looked cool, but um, you have an all-new reed valve for 1982. Uh, the alloy swing arm runs on needle bearings now, and they also uh, lighten the bike quite a bit. The 82 model is 10 pounds lighter than 1981, so uh, they took weight out of a whole lot of stuff. Uh, that was one of the problems in 81. The bike, uh, on top of being not a great performer, was very overweight. Uh, so for, 80, for 82 here, they lightened the bike, uh, redesigned a lot of stuff, beefed up the motor, and came out with a much, much better machine. Uh, this 82 is a better bike all around. 
Uh, super popular bike at the time, really well reviewed even now. A lot of people love these 82s. Uh, really the only thing that holds it back is the four-speed tranny. Uh, the five-speed is more desirable overall, but uh, by most standards, this is an excellent machine and uh, really the first excellent Honda open class machine. Things moved really fast in motocross terms in the early 80s, and for 1983, you get an all-new uh, CR machine in the open class. The CR480R has a major redesign this year. Uh, you get all new bodywork that goes to the orangey red, which I love this look. It was uh, basically looked like the 82 factory Hondas went to the orangey red with the blue seat. I think this is a great look, especially with the yellow plates on the open class bikes. I've had two of these CR480s. They are phenomenal machines. Uh, even today, they're very desirable bikes for, you know, vintage class racing. This is a major, major redesign this year. Uh, the engine stays very similar as ter in terms of displacement. It's the same 472 cc's they had used in 1982. But you have all new porting, and you also have the addition of a five-speed transmission, which is a big addition that a lot of people found very desirable this year. Uh, this is still before you get disc brakes, so the dual leading shoe brakes are in the front, the drums. Uh, you get an all-new chassis this year, though. They added a removable subframe uh, for 1983, which eases maintenance of the shock. This was very trick stuff. Uh, the only other manufacturer that had this in 1983 was KTM, of all things. Uh, this is, I mean, basically you wouldn't get this for Yamaha, I think, maybe until 1993. And, uh, you know, Suzuki and what have you didn't do it into the 90s as well. So this was really, really cool stuff. I remember when I first got my 83 Honda, Taking it apart, I was amazed at how, you know, modern it was and the way it's assembled. Uh, some old bikes just seem cobby and uh, really kind of crude, but this this 83 is, you know, it, it's very much like a modern machine in so many ways in terms of the materials on it, the way it's put together. Uh, Honda really had their stuff together here in 1983. You have an all-new fork up front. It's still a 43-millimeter fork. It has 14-way adjustable compression damping, but no rebound. Uh, basically, I don't think anybody had rebound damping in their forks at this point in motocross. Uh, you do get an all-new rear end uh, when the ProLink has a new revised ratio. Uh, it adds uh, compression and rebound damping. In 82, you just had four settings for compression. Here for 83, you get 20 rebound settings and 10 compression damping adjustments. So it's much more adjustable. Uh, if you ever ridden one of these old bikes, of course, they're super soft. Uh, by modern standards, it feels like riding a marshmallow. But if you get somebody like Racetech or somebody to do the suspension on these bikes, they are really, really capable. Uh, the bike is certainly plenty fast. These old 500s have no lack of power. Uh, you know, if you're brave enough to hold it wide open, the sucker will go. So there's no lack of that. Uh, now, this, of course, is air cooling. This is before liquid cooling was kind of uh, common in the uh, open class. But a bike like this, certainly the little bit of power you would have lost from uh, heat over the term of a uh, long moto, I don't think most mortals would have missed it. Uh, this is the first year you get the safety seat. You get the really beautiful, as I said, uh, blue seat, and it goes up the tank a little bit better than uh, 1982. Now, if you ever sat on one of these bikes, they're super slim. The bike feels really light, and it is light. At 224 pounds, it was actually lighter than a lot of 250s in 1982. It was way lighter than a YZ250, and uh, the bike feels it on the track. Like I said, if you get the suspension done, you can go really fast on these bikes. They handle really well. Turning is excellent, and the bike feels like a feather. You know, it's Honda did all kinds of stuff in 83 here to, to lighten the weight again. It's once again lighter than 1982. Uh, they you use know, magnesium lightweight components throughout. Uh, things like the Kickstarter or, or aluminum, shifter, brake pedal, all that stuff is very modern in that way. Uh, the silencer is aluminum. You know, all this stuff that you would have uh, not expected in 1982-83. Uh, this is kind of one of the first quote-unquote modern bikes in terms of the components and stuff on it and the quality of everything when you everything from the way the levers feel uh, to the grips to the overall quality of the bike is is very impressive and uh, honda really killed it in 1983 all the bikes the 125 250 and uh, 480 are excellent machines and this is a great year for honda they pretty much won all the shootouts this year and i said this 480 is one of the all-time iconic hondas of the 80s and uh, they really got it right this year in 1983 for 1984, incredibly, we get another all-new machine in the open class for Honda. Uh, this is the first year for the CR500R. Uh, Honda upped the displacement 21 cc's for 1984 and came out with an all-new machine. Now, this bike is not a minor revamp. It's a complete redesign. You have a all-new motor that moves the Kickstarter from the left-hand side, a la Husqvarna, to the right. Uh, which was more in line, I guess, with what everybody else was doing. Uh, they have The motor remains air-cooled, uh, although if you look at the center cases, you can see it 
looks like there was a place for water cooling, so maybe this was something they maybe thought they were going to do with liquid cooling at some point, but changed their mind, I'm not sure. But in any case, this is the last year for the air cooling on the CR500. Uh, they did have uh, add these little ram scoops to the side of the motor. almost looks like it has radiators, but they're just little air scoops, which I always thought was pretty interesting. I will say I love the looks of this bike. It is a great-looking machine. Uh, this color combo, of course, is my favorite of all the Hondas. I love these uh, 80s bikes with the orangey red and the blue seat. Um, good looking motorcycle. You get all new body work this year. You also get a front disc brake for the first time, which is definitely helps on these bikes, which are really powerful. That was the one thing that really always sketched me out a little bit about my 83s, where uh, you come into, into a corner too fast and you couldn't guarantee the thing was going to stop. Uh, you know, you get used to riding a bike with disc brakes and you get one of these really powerful old open class bikes and you have to think ahead because the bike isn't going to stop on a dime. Uh, they maintain the 43 millimeter uh, air adjustable forks. Uh, this, this year they have 14-way compression damping, um, five-ratio, uh, five-speed uh, close-ratio transmission is maintained, although they did change the ratio slightly to uh, suit the new power characteristics for 1984. Uh, they added rubber-mounted uh, handlebars to reduce vibration, uh, something any 500 would appreciate. Uh, they also added a uh, strong new frame that uh, had revised geometry here for 1984. Once again, they redesigned the ProLink slightly. Uh, you have a new uh, ratios in the rear end. The bike itself, as I said, was not a great performer on the track. Uh, the new motor was harder to ride. Uh, some people had complained in 83 that the bike didn't pull far enough on top. I know for my 83, it was really low to mid power bands in 82, 83. And they really didn't, you know, if you tried to rev them out, they really just didn't pull. And for 84, Honda tried to give... Uh, the bike more top-end power, and it definitely had more top-end power, but uh, it was really hard to ride. The bike came on really strong, really suddenly, just kind of a crazy difficult-to-ride power band. These years here in the mid-80s is kind of the, the high point for horsepower in the 500 class. It seems like all the manufacturers are just trying to make the most amount of power, and the bikes were kind of getting out of hand, which I think was kind of leading to some of the um, you know, disillusionment with these bikes in the first place. It was causing people to go down to the smaller machines. So a decade before, RM370 or YZ360 or some of those, you know, a quote-unquote mid-sized bike. But these new 500s were just handfuls, and I think that really kind of scared some people away from riding them. Um, the new disc brake, as I said, did help with the uh, stopping the machine, but the suspension was uh, not great this year. You know, it was mediocre on the 250 and 125. It worked decently enough, but um, on the 500, the, the additional weight and power really overtaxed it. The bike was just pretty much a handful, and most people would say a way worse machine than it had been in uh, 1983. For 1985, we get another all-new machine in the 500 class for Honda. Uh, this is the second year of the CR500R, and this is the first year for liquid cooling. We get an all-new top end, which of course has uh, liquid cooling built in. We also get a bridge for the exhaust. Now, this was to address some cracking issues that... Uh, many people had suffered from in 1984, uh, mainly probably more on the smaller bikes than the big one, but uh, this was a known issue in 1984 causing pistons to crack, so they added this bridge to the exhaust to help prevent that. They also revised the crankshaft uh, for 1985 to be more reliable. They replaced the plastic spacers, which had been failure-prone in 1984, with new steel spacers uh, that they hoped would be more reliable. Uh, the engine has a significant uh, change in porting. The displacement remains exactly the same, but the motor ran very different in 1985. Uh, you also get a new uh, PJ flat slide carburetor. This is the first year for the PJs on these. And that combined with the addition of liquid cooling did a lot to, to alleviate a lot of the jetting issues which had driven uh, riders kind of nuts in 1984. It was hard to get the 84 model to run cleanly. There was also a lot of problem with pinging. Uh, a lot of these old air-cooled 500s had an issue with that. They'd get hot and uh, ping, and the 85 uh, motor ran much better with the liquid cooling and the new carburetor. Uh, on the dyno, it put out seven more horsepower in the mid-range, and that's pretty crazy when you consider uh, a lot of people already thought the 84 model was too fast. So this 85 is an absolute rocket ship. They're just getting a little bit ahead of themselves, I think. This is part of the reason the 500 class was uh, diminishing in popularity, just because the bikes were getting so difficult to ride. And in 1985, Honda went all out and really made a beast of a machine. Uh, in addition to the all-new motor, you get an all-new frame here for 1985. They added an all-new tank to the machine, of course, to accommodate the liquid cooling. Even though the brochure claims the new tank is a work style that lowers the center of gravity, in reality, this 85 tank is much more intrusive than the old 84 and 83 models were. As I said earlier, if you sit on an 83, it's actually a very slim machine, very comfortable. It's easy to slide forward. Uh, this 85, because the way that the radiator is actually set pretty high, it pushed the tank up and back a little bit, so it made it harder to get forward. 
Uh, it's kind of really the one of the main complaints with this 85, other than the uh, really brutish powers. The ergonomics are not excellent. That tank was kind of big and bulbous and intrusive, and I don't think many people cared for it on the 500 this year. Uh, you get an all-new swing arm, which is supposedly stronger and lighter weight. Uh, you have rubber mounting uh, handlebars this year as well, which is nice for uh, quelling vibration. The forks remain a 43 millimeter uh, air adjustable fork uh, with 12 position compression damping. Now, this is the last year of the cart non cartridge uh, damper rod style forks on the CR500. Uh, these forks were not particularly great in 1985. I think most of the reviewers didn't think they were awesome. Uh, none of these non cartridge forks were like mind blowingly great in, in stock condition anyway, but uh, on the 500, of course, it's more critical with the power and weight of the machine. And I think the bike was a little under suspended here in 1985. The ProLink shock was new as well. And again, it was a lackluster performer here in 1985. Um, the bike itself was a real brute of a machine. I think most people actually thought it was maybe a little too powerful. A lot of the aftermarket companies would actually tune the motor down, detune it a bit uh, to try and get it to make it more rideable. Uh, the machine was, you know, certainly plenty fast, but uh, I think even guys like David Bailey and stuff thought the bike was maybe a little too much. Um, I've ridden one of these things, and it's a pretty scary machine. I mean, even the 83 480 is pretty, pretty gnarly machine, but this 85 really hits like a ton of bricks and kind of a handful. Uh, it looks great, though. Uh, the bodywork this year, this is a really good-looking machine. Uh, I love the styling on all these 85s. They are great-looking bikes. And uh, the, certainly in terms of looks and technology, the bike was a winner on the track, but um, you had to be a really manly man to control this machine. For 1986, we get the first 500 Honda that is not a completely new machine. Uh, this 86 model is clearly a updated version of the 85 bike, but they did make some really important improvements that, that made the machine a better bike on the track. Probably the most important addition is the all-new 43mm cartridge forks from Showa. Uh, this is a real big breakthrough in suspension technology, probably right up there with the first long travel suspension in the 70s when they uh, really started upping suspension uh, travel. This cartridge fork allows a much wider range of operation. Uh, it prevents the oil from cavitating, getting like air bubbles in it. Uh, it just is a much more efficient design. It's something that Honda have been using on their works bikes for several years at this point. And 86 is the first year where you get this technology uh, passed on to the average person. And it makes a big difference in terms of uh, how well these forks handle the track. They were by far the best forks available in 1986 and uh, gave the Hondas a big, big advantage on the track this year. Uh, other than that, the bike is very similar to 1985. As you can see, styling-wise, it's almost identical. They did make some subtle adjustments to the tank. Uh, a lot of people, as I said, really were not happy with the 85 tank. It was made it difficult to slide forward in turns, made the bike feel even heavier than it was. Uh, kind of a bulbous, uh, chunky-feeling machine. In 36, they slimmed the tank down a little bit. It, it's still a big boy by any measure. I mean, you're not going to confuse this with a 1989 CR125 and its razor-thin layout for sure, uh, but it was a little bit improved here for 1986. Uh, they made some other changes to the motor. They had changed the piston profile and also changed the cylinder head and the ignition slightly, trying to give the bike a little... Uh, smoother power. They also uh, made some changes to make it easier starting as well. That was another problem with the 84 and 85. They were just an absolute bear to start. And this 86, while still a manly, manly machine to crank over, is a little bit easier. Uh, they changed the uh, some few things in the transmission, the shift fork and the engagement dogs to make it a little more durable. Um, a lot of little things. You know, they changed the uh, air filter element slightly. Um, the of course the forks, uh, as I said, were all new. The shock is new as well. It doesn't have the great um, increase in performance though, like the forks had this year. The shock remains probably the weak link of the uh, machine overall. Uh, none of these Pro Link rears in the mid '80s were that great, uh, but it worked okay. You know, it wasn't like unrideable in stock condition, but uh, a lot of people at this point, even in the mid '80s, were upgrading to an aftermarket shock if you wanted to get better performance. Uh, rear brakes are still a drum. This is the last year for the drum brakes on the CR, but they did make the brake shoes three millimeters wider to improve braking. Uh, also, they were hoping that would get rid of some of the squeaking issues. Some of these old ones would get the hot and squeak like crazy, and uh, that was a, a adjustment they made in 1986 to try and improve that. They also added a little greater range of adjustability to the uh, front brake lever so you could get make it a little more comfortable for you while you're riding. Um, overall, though, again, this is really a refined version of the 85 package. The 85 machine was uh, an excellent machine if you were manly enough to handle it and got the suspension work done. 86 
improved the suspension quite a bit. The motor is still burly, but r much more raceable. And this is an excellent, excellent 500 overall. Uh, at th this point, Kawasaki was kind of finally becoming much more competitive in the 500 class. So the Honda actually had a pretty good competitor in the form of the KX500 this year. Uh, but this was a great, great machine. One of my favorite looking machines of all time, I think. Uh, this is my favorite color combo, as I said earlier, and they added the gold rims here in 1986, and that really sets the machines off, gives it kind of that works look that I love. Uh, one of the iconic machines in uh, 500 history for sure, this 86 CR500R. For 1987, we get another year of big changes on the CR500R. Uh, you have all new styling this year. They revised the bodywork across the CR lineups in 87. I love the looks of this machine. It's a good, good looking bike. I had the 87 125. Love that machine. Of course, the 250 is a phenomenal bike as well. The 500 gets a new tank. It's smaller. It's a two gallon uh, capacity. It's slimmer through the middle. It's still, if you ever sit on one of these, it's still pretty wide. It's uh, not the easiest bike to get forward on. Uh, but it is better than the 85 and 86 version, uh, certainly. Uh, the seat goes up farther up the tank. Uh, again, though, super not super slim in the way the later 500s after 89 were. Uh, this bike has got an all-new frame this year. Uh, you have a redesigned ProLink rear suspension. You get an all-new uh, swing arm with a composite a hybrid design construction. You also have a piggyback shock. They move the uh, canister, the remote canister, uh, on the shock to the top of the shock body. And while this might have seemed like a good idea in terms of packaging, it caused issues where uh, the canister was out of the cooling air, and it was really one of these things that uh, caused it to have some fading issues here in 1987. It wasn't the best idea by Honda, uh, but it was a neat-looking thing anyway. Um, the front suspension continues to be the 43 millimeter. Uh, Shawa front forks, which were cartridge. This is still uh, one of the best forks. I think it's if this. Yeah, in '87, it's still the only bike in the class that has these cartridge forks. Suzuki did uh, make cartridge forks available on their RMs in '87 as well, uh, but they did not make a 500 at this point. They had stopped the 500 at least in the U.S. in 1984. Uh, so this was the Honda is the only one still that has the, the cartridge forks. And this is one of the reasons that a lot of people picked the CR as a better machine than the KX this year, even though uh, the KX's motor was probably better. Uh, the Honda has much better forks here with these cartridges. Uh, you also get a uh, work style removable clutch, uh, so you can easily access the clutch and uh, swap plates out really easy. This is a real nice feature in 1987, uh, something that a lot of the competitors would not get till three or four years later. Uh, you have a longer connecting rod here for 1987, and that was done to increase low end power, uh, give it maybe a little more grunt. Uh, it's a smoother engine uh, for 1987, still not a pussycat by any means. Uh, but definitely uh, maybe a little bit easier to ride. Uh, all these mid-80s Hondas are pretty uh, pretty nasty machines in general, so uh, wimps need not apply there. Uh, the rear disc brake is new this year. You have an all-new disc in the back, and that definitely helps with uh, stopping the big red beast here. Um, overall, I think it's a great-looking motorcycle. Uh, certainly a very competitive machine, and, uh, you know, neck and neck, depending on where you read, uh, some people did prefer the, the Kawasaki just because the engine was... Uh, a little easier to manage. The Kawasaki had the KIP system, the power valve system, and uh, that's something Honda would never put on their 500s. By this point, um, Honda had already come out with their second generation of power valve, uh, the HPP Honda PowerPort system on the 250, uh, and the 500 never got the ATAC system, which is what the 125 was using at this point, uh, the variable exhaust port, or the HPP. Honda just figured, I guess, the thing had enough power as it was. And I think the 500 thing was never a matter of the bikes needed more power, uh, but the power valve, like on the Kawasaki, allowed them to give a little smoother, broader, easier-to-use power band to their 500. And that was always a thing that Honda seemed to be chasing with this engine. It never had any problem with making tons of power. Uh, the issue was just to make it rideable. Um, and this this was always kind of a thing where uh, the Honda, every year, they were always tweaking it, trying to make it smoother, trying to make it smoother, changing the gearing, changing the porting. Um, and in 87, they did a little bit of that, but this is still uh, one of the gnarlier machines available in 1987. After several years of pretty big changes on the 500, 88 is really a refinement year for Honda. Uh, the 88 500 does get an all-new look, though, this year. They went to the blood red uh, look, which is kind of a throwback to the 82 color. Um, I hated this change in 1988. I thought it, I loved, of course, the orangey red and the blue seat and stuff, but now it looks cool. I actually quite like it. It's grown on me over the years. Uh, but again, at the time, I wasn't too sure. I uh, definitely wasn't sold on it. Uh, this bike does not get the all-new body work that the 88 250 got, the low-boy layout and what have you. So it really is just an 87 
uh, Honda CR500 with, uh, you know, a different colored plastic. Of course, it does have a different look with the red seat and the uh, the unpainted cylinder this year. Definitely kind of changes the look in spite of the fact that the, the, all the bodywork effectively is the same. Uh, you do get some minor changes to the engine. Again, Honda every year is making these tweaks to the gearing and the motor to try and smooth things out. And for uh, 1988, they changed fourth and fifth gear ratios. Uh, they also added a heavier flywheel with a little more mass here to hopefully smooth out the power and also make it a little easier to start again. Starting always an issue on these things. Uh, they also reshaped the Kickstarter slightly to make the starting easier as well. Um, the front fork is still a uh, compression adjustable only. Um, this is something that Honda was a little behind the times on. The Kawasaki and uh, Suzuki both had cartridge forks available in, by 1988 and the KX500 uh, definitely was finally catching up and passing the CR500. The combination of uh, the cartridge forks finally brought their suspension up to snuff, and they already had an engine that was a little broader and easier to use in the CR, and a lot of people picked the KX as being a better machine here in 1988, although the Honda still had plenty of people who loved it. Uh, the rear shock this year maintains the kind of oddball piggyback style shock of 1987. No big changes there for 88. Uh, little stuff, they added a new composite braking uh, front brake hose. A lot of people didn't really care for this change. It didn't really seem to hurt Honda too much though. Uh, getting rid of the braided steel line, they still had the best brakes in motocross at this time. They also reshaped the handlebars for improved riding position. Um, on the track, this bike was still a manly machine. Uh, very, very fast bike. Uh, I think the uh, Kawasaki though was probably the better uh, 500 by most standards in 1988. For 1989, we get what would become the last major update to the CR500R. Uh, the bike this year is all new. After a mild refresh in 88, Honda came out swinging in 89 with a complete redesign of the CR500. This year, they get the low boy layout of the 88 CR250. What that means is a much lower routed pipe. Uh, you also get all new tank that actually holds 0.4 gallons more fuel, but sits much lower and narrower in the chassis. Uh, it's again, not as narrow as, you know, like a CR125, of course, but compared to the 87 and 88 and 85 to 86 for that matter, this 89 is much narrower. It's much easier to slide forward. The bike is very comfortable. Uh, it has great styling. I love the looks of this machine. In fact, I picked this as my favorite year ever for Honda machines. It's one of the prettiest dirt bikes ever built, in my opinion. Uh, I love this looks of this 89 bike. The graphics, the color combo, the kind of monochromatic look, all of it comes together so nicely and really just is a purposeful, uh, great-looking motorcycle. Uh, you have the real big change up front to the new inverted forks. These are a 45-millimeter Shawa cartridge inverted fork, and to be honest, they don't work nearly as well as the old uh, non-inverted versions did. These early inverted forks had a kind of a hit-or-miss record, certainly early on. They were put on here for a couple of reasons. Uh, they offered a great deal more rigidity to the front end. And if you're a guy like Rick Johnson or Jeff Stanton, you really needed that kind of precision up front. But they did tend to have a provide much more feedback to the rider's hands. Uh, they were probably, especially this early version, a little too stiff. They had a hard time getting these things to work as well as the old uh, regular uh, non-inverted units early on. 89, though, is a really bad year for Honda suspension. They ended up actually recalling these forks midway through the year, trying to get them to work better because so many people had complained about their performance. Uh, really kind of the worst part about the whole chassis because the rest of the bike is just spot on here in 1989. You get an all-new frame that's much stronger. Uh, it has a really, really um, nice feel to it. The bike is a great combination of you know stability and uh, turning precision. It's certainly not a Baja machine in the way the KX500 is, but it's actually a little more stable than the 88, less prone to the violent head shake the older model had. And if you get the suspension fixed, it's a really great handling motorcycle. In stock condition, the forks really held it back though. I will say that the 500 tender to be maybe a little bit less um, prone to the harshness that the smaller bike suffered from the CR250. I think the added weight actually smoothed out some of the crappy mid-stroke harshness on these forks, but uh, they were gr they were not good forks at all. They are pretty grim this year. Uh, you have an all-new shock. It went back to a normal kind of a piggyback uh, style. Got retired to a, uh, move the shock reservoir to a more traditional position. You get some minor changes to the motor this year. 
Uh, the bike has a different power band, though. It, it focuses the power up higher than the power band. For 89, the low end is a little softer. Mid-range is more muted, and the top end is stronger. Some people like that. Some people didn't. Uh, if you're in this bike, it's a pretty strong performer. A good friend of mine has one of these right now. If you ride it, it's a, it's a pretty scary bike. You better be make sure you're pointing in the right direction when you grab a handful of the throttle. Uh, I would say his uh, 88KX500, if you're in one of the Kawasaki's, are definitely much easier to ride than these. But, you know, the, the layout's much better on this. The change in the layout in 89 definitely put the Honda Ford in terms of ergonomics over the Kawasaki, but the lack of a power valve uh, really held it back somewhat in terms of the rideability of the engine. Um, overall, though, this is a big improvement in every way except the front forks. The front forks are kind of the only thing that's really the notch on the armor here for 1989. Other than that, this is a great, great racing motorcycle. After its complete redesign in 1989, the CR500R was back for 1990 with a surprising amount of changes, actually. A uh, first look at the bike, it doesn't look a lot different aside from color. Uh, this year was uh, the year Honda went back to the earlier 80s orangish-red a color I always loved, as I said earlier. Uh, I really like this color. I love the looks of the 1990s. I mean, a lot of people weren't a big fan of them back then when they went to the white frame. It certainly was a big change visually. Uh, the bike is, you know, monochromatic in the way sort of the 89 is, but uh, it doesn't have the blue seat and what have you. But it has the same color that they were using like in the 86, 87 era. Uh, but they added a white frame this year. I think this was done to have the bikes kind of pop a little bit more on television. I remember in um, 89, I think Jeff Stanton, maybe at Pontiac, ran uh, a white frame, kind of testing out the looks of it. And uh, I guess it, maybe they thought it made the bike stand out a little more. I think the bike is clean. Again, I love the the graphics are kind of understated. I do think the 89 is, is a better looking bike overall, you know, in hindsight. Uh, but back in 1990, I did like this change back to the orangish red. Uh, body work is the same as 1989. Uh, this year, the 250 gets an all new seat, tank, juncture, new body work, side panels, all that stuff's new on the 250. The 500 didn't get the benefit of this upgrade, though. It basically kept, more or less, would keep uh, the same seat tank until the end in 2001. Uh, this was kind of, a, the 89 was really the last major upgrade that the, uh, the t seat tank and stuff would get on these things. But um, in 1990 here, you get the, the return of the orange. You also get some changes to the frame uh, aimed at improving handling. They moved the head pipe five millimeters rearward, and that was done to improve the straight line handling, kind of reduce some of the head shake, uh, get a little more uh, weight on the front wheel. Uh, they also uh, increased the size of the steering stem uh, from 26 millimeters to 30 millimeters and added larger bearings in there as well. Uh, they also changed the forecaster slightly for 1990, and they increased the backbone thickness. So even though the bike looks very similar, they made a lot of subtle changes to the, the frame. They also uh, widened the foot pegs three millimeters and moved them up three millimeters. So ergonomically, if you're sitting on an 89 and a 90, they do feel a little differently, even though they look, uh, aside from color, identical. Uh, for 1990, they also made some changes aimed at smoothing out the forks action. Again, in, in 89, that had really been the worst thing about the 89 CRs. Uh, the forks were just, just awful. And this 1990 version is a little bit better. As I said, I had all three bikes in 1990, and none of them the suspension was great on. Um, I ended up getting my 125 and 250 revalved and was constantly fiddling with them, trying to get them to work um, better. I do know from experience, I just revamped, um, I rebuilt one of these uh, 90s a couple of years ago and had Race Tech redo the suspension, and it was actually phenomenal. So they can, a modern shop can make this suspension work. So if you're looking to buy one of these and race it, you certainly can get the suspension working. The only drawback is these old forks, this uh, 8990, they had a lot of particulate contamination in them. The oil would end up getting quickly contaminated by little shavings coming off the inside of the fork, and the oil would, you know, quickly deteriorate the fork's action as it got clogged up. So you really do have to stay on top of the maintenance on these and change the oil regularly or they will deteriorate. Um, of the three, the 500 probably had the best suspension this year. Again, the weight and the power of the bike actually worked pretty well. The forks were kind of harsh on the smaller bikes. And uh, on the uh, 125 and the 250, they weren't particularly great performers, but the 500 seemed to work the best of the three. None of them were as good as what you found on the Kawasaki in 1990, but uh, the 500 was probably, if you're going to race one of the bikes stock, the 500 was probably the best choice. Uh, for 1990, you also get some subtle changes to the motor. Uh, they uh, changed the crankshaft, also made some changes to the intake and the carburetor, and all that was designed to smooth the power out a little bit more and move it down in the power band. In 89, the bike had been really fast, uh, but it was mostly mid and up. 
And a lot of people were not too psyched with this on a 500, and they wanted to move the power down a little bit. And for 1990, uh, the motor is smoother, and the power has moved more down to the low to mid-range. If you ride the 89 and 90 back-to-back, -back, which I've done, I had my 90 and my buddy has an 89, you definitely notice the 89 has a harder hit and pulls farther on top, where the, the 90 runs more like a tractor, which is, at least for me, more what you want on a 500. So a lot of people at the time thought that was a, an improvement overall. Uh, they also added additional clutch plates uh, in the clutch to uh, have a little additional durability and also improve the lever feel and action. Uh, overall, in 1990, I think most people still thought the Kawasaki was probably the better machine. The Kips uh, motor was uh, still a little more broad, but this 1990 was definitely closer to the way the Kawasaki ran, and I think most people thought it was a big improvement. Um, unless you were like a pro guy, uh, the 90 was probably easier, much easier to ride, and I think most people thought this was a definitely an improvement over 1989 in terms of performance. For 1991, the CR500R gets its last kind of major revision to the bodywork, at least in terms of the actual design of the plastic, not just the color. Uh, you get the all-new uh, 1990 250-style rear quarter panels and airbox combo. I always thought this was a cleaner look overall. I remember when I had my 90 um, wanting to put the updated airbox and number plates on the 125 that year, but it was pretty expensive. You had to get a whole new subframe, and it was just wasn't cost-effective. I know a lot of guys did it, but... Um, I was definitely always jealous I saw somebody with that uh, back then. But uh, for 91, the 500 does get that. It keeps the old-style uh, front tank shroud design, which is interesting. It's kind of a combination of old and new there. Uh, but it does get the new airbox, which is, a, again, I think a little cleaner design. According to Han, it also increased the airbox volume. The 1990-style airbox was a little larger and had a little better airflow through it. Um, you get also a totally new fork. Again, the 1990 and 89 forks were pretty terrible. And for 91, Honda is still trying to get that situation sorted out. They have an all-new Shawa front fork, which features a spring above cartridge design and had revised spring rates and new uh, anodized inner fork tubes, which were going to try and cut down on that particulate contamination I talked about in 1990, which was uh, really, really terrible. You get all these little shavings coming off the fork, spring sliding against the inner liner of the tubes, where they anodize the interior of it to try and make it a little more slippery so you wouldn't get those shavings in there fouling everything up. Uh, you also have an all-new shock, which is interestingly a Kiaba shock. So you have Shawa forks and a Kiaba shock here for 1991. There's also a revision to the linkage ratio here uh, for 1991. And they also added a Teflon coating to the linkage bushings and shock mounts. And Honda claimed that lowered uh, friction by 50%, which is pretty significant. Uh, they changed the combustion chamber slightly. Um, again, trying to get the power to be a little smoother, easier starting. Uh, they made some tweaks to the carburetor. And also tweak the chassis geometry slightly again to try and improve steering precision. Visually, you get the change here in 1991 to the white shrouds. I really hated this change in 1991. I, you'll hear this a lot from me. I, anytime they make some big drastic change, I'm always slow to kind of come on board. I still don't love this 91 look. Um, the tiger stripe seat I thought was kind of bizarre, and the graphics I thought were weird, but it has grown on me quite a bit. I, like again, in, in 90, I thought the bikes were just gorgeous, and I didn't really love this kind of crazy look, but now time has kind of softened that feeling for me, and I, I do like the looks of the bike now. It's a pretty cool looking machine. Uh, definitely makes the white shrouds definitely stand out a little more, I guess, but um, I think in my heart, I still kind of like the monochromatic look a little better from the year before. After the graphical changes of 1991, Honda was ready to tell me to hold their beer uh, for 1992 because they really changed the looks of their Hondas in 92. Uh, in, this is the year that Honda went with the nuclear red for the first time, which in this one year is actually kind of a really light pinkish, almost translucent red. If you saw these bikes in person when they were new, it is a very unique color and really kind of only this one year in 92 do they have this shade. Uh, I was again kind of like dumbfounded by this change. I was like, what the hell? I thought the white tank was goofy looking at the time and just really wasn't a big fan. But I know I'm in the minority there now. Everybody loves this look. And now I'm actually quite used to it. But in 92, I remember going to the Honda dealership and just, you know, scratching my head like, what the hell are they doing here? Uh, another thing this first year does is it fades really badly. So at, once you had this bike and it uh, sat out in the sun at the track a little bit, it would turn like a salmon pink. <laughs> so this, it's almost impossible to find any of this original uh, 92 plastic because in 93 and 94, they, they started dialing back this early kind of a weird pink color and added a little more red back into it. And it's more durable. And any of the plastic you buy for these now, unless you could find an OEM one, 
is probably going to be like the 94 color, which again is subtly different than this. Uh, aside from the looks, though, the bike does have a few minor updates for 92. Not a big, uh, big year as far as that goes. Honda again was always searching for that magic, you know, smoother, stronger power, kind of like what the Kawasaki had. And for 92, uh, they took a couple of uh, kind of easy tricks to mellow out the power. They geared the bike way up and they put a big ginormous silencer on it. The silencer is like twice the size of 1991 here for 92. It's almost the length of the rear fender. It's kind of crazy how big it is. And these, if you've ever ridden this bike, it really mellows out the power. Uh, the difference between this bike with the stock exhaust versus like a pro circuit shorty silencer is like unbelievable how much it wakes up the power. So in stock condition, this bike feels a lot more mellow, even though the horsepower is not much changed. Um, it has a more muted feel to it and the gearing it way up, of course, also uh, kind of lessens that sensation of sudden acceleration. So Honda was trying to mellow these things out and rather than redesign the motor like Kawasaki had done, uh, they're kind of going the cheap fix way here in the early 90s. Uh, in addition to the uh, subtle motor changes, you get an all new fork again. They're, you know, searching every year. Uh, and this is, we get an all-new fork again, 43 millimeter inverted Shawa fork, which is a little smaller in diameter than the earlier ones. Remember, they were using a 45 early on. A lot of people complained that they were a bit harsh and just weren't uh, giving a good feel to the front end. And so they were downsized a little bit here for 1992. Uh, they also redesigned the triple clamp assembly uh, to uh, improve the feel up front as well. Uh, one thing you do get here is an all-new brake. Uh, for 1992. This is the first year that Honda put like the little shorty levers on there, had a little more adjustability. And I remember loving this, you know, and uh, trying to rig up a way to put something like this on my 1990 when I had it. Uh, I was really jealous about this brake. It definitely, these were by far the best brakes in motocross in 1992, and they work really well. Uh, you ride one today, of course, they don't feel like a the power of a modern KTM has. Uh, but in 1992, these were the by far the best brakes you could buy. They were excellent. Uh, you also have a little change. They lighten the wheels assembly slightly for 1992. Uh, other than that, the, the 92 is uh, looks visually much different than a 1991, but uh, mainly that is the uh, most significant change. The, the basic beating heart of the bike is not much different than the year before. For 1993, you don't get a whole lot in the way of changes on the CR500R. As I said, this year Honda did subtly change the color a little bit. This is, uh, Honda described it as a more orangey red. So it's still technically nuclear red, but the shade is uh, less pink and more orange for 1993. And again, if you go to buy replacement plastic now, chances are you're going to get this more 93, 94 color than the 92, which was really just a one-year design. Uh, mechanically, the bike is almost identical. They did add... New fourth and fifth gears for 1993. That's the only significant change to the motor. Uh, they're a little wider. Uh, I don't think anybody was planning on making a CR500 into a desert sled because the uh, head shake was a little bit sketchy at speed. The bike was definitely not uh, made for Baja, but I guess that kind of smoothed out the power in the upper gears and did give it a little more flexibility if you didn't want to take it off-road. Uh, the forks are new for 1993. It uh, basically gets the same forks as the CR250 did. Again, Honda is swapping out the front forks almost every year, trying to get one that worked. Uh, Newsflash, these didn't really work very well either. All these forks are just set up poorly, and there's something was going on in the 90s here with Honda and their, uh, their testing where they just couldn't seem to get these things to work on any of the bikes, the 125, 250, or 500. Some years, uh, you know, the 125 would have Shawa forks or Kiaba forks, and the Honda... 250 would have Shawa, and they all seem to have the same problems in terms of the performance, which leads me to believe it wasn't necessarily the components. Uh, it seemed to be more like the people who are setting them up. Uh, in a lot of years, they had very similar components to what you would have found in the competition, which seemed to work much better. So again, it seems like uh, some of the problem was with setup on these bikes, but the front fork performance on any of these early 90s CRs is pretty bad. Uh, you can make them work with the, you know, an upgrade. Modern guys can make them work, but at the time they were considered pretty poor. Uh, for 1993, you also get a new throttle housing uh, with a different sleeve material to reduce friction. Um, other than that, there's really not much in the way of changes. Uh, minor update to the graphics, but even that doesn't look much different than uh, 1992. Uh, overall, I think of these couple of years, this is probably my least favorite. I never really care for these 93 graphics very much. Um, the bike's not a bad looking machine. I I think that the the newer uh, updated bodywork when they went to the white tank and what have you just didn't work as well with this old fashioned bodywork as it does on the 250 and the 125. The the newer 92 style bodywork I think it looks a little better than the nuclear red. The the CR 500 always looked like a bit of an afterthought with this old bodywork, but um, the bike itself is still a solid performer in spite of being a couple year old design at this point. 
There's not a ton to talk about here in 1994 as far as changes go on the CR500. You did get my favorite of the 92, 93, 94 graphics. I really like this yellow design. In fact, I ended up putting a version of this on my 1990 250. I got fluorescent plastic for it, uh, this nuclear red stuff, and actually went with these graphics on my uh, my 250. I thought it looked pretty good. I always like these overall look of this bike in 94. Uh, these graphics are pretty cool looking in my opinion. Uh, other than that, there really is not much in the way of actual changes to the bike. Uh, it's pretty telling when the major bullet point in the brochure is the fact that they painted the engine silver instead of black for 1994. <laughs> kind of let you know where you're looking at here. Uh, other than the new paint, uh, there were new stiffer springs for the forks, uh, new damping rates front and rear, and a new slicker uh, fork oil. Um, and they also added some stronger spokes to the rear wheel. So, But other than that, uh, the 94 CR500 is the same as it had been in 1993. Here for 1995, you get a really bold change in terms of the appearance of the CR500. Uh, this is the first year that Honda went, and really the only year, where they went totally purple on everything. Uh, this is a very 90s motif, certainly. Kawasaki would basically do the same thing with their KX lineup a year later in 1996. Uh, this is another one of those changes I wasn't a super fan of, but now I appreciate it for its uh, 90s style uniqueness, much like the 92 RMs. Uh, I think at the time it was definitely a love it or hate it kind of deal. Um, I was on the hated camp then, but I can live with it now. Uh, otherwise, the bike is really not a whole lot changed for 1995. Uh, you do get a uh, new fork, all new fork. It has a Kiaba fork here for 1995 that is shared with the CR250. You also get a new shock with a larger shock shaft, uh, also Kiaba here in 95. This suspension actually worked pretty decently. Uh, the CR500, again, was acknowledged as having most years the best suspension of the, the three Honda full-size bikes. And uh, this stuff works pretty well. The fork certainly was more liked on the 500 than it was on the on the 250 for whatever reason. Uh, other than that, there's not a lot of changes. The frame's the same. They did upgrade the the uh, foot pegs the year for 1995. Uh, you get a switch from a 32 millimeter peg to a 43 millimeter peg. Um, really, Honda was finally getting with the program here in '95. Kawasaki had kind of started the huge platform peg thing in 1990. And uh, Honda was slow to kind of jump on that, but they finally upgraded the size quite a bit here in 95. Wheels are upgraded. There's a larger axle in the front, uh, more durable bearings, and then an upgrade to Excel rims uh, to kind of stop some of the cracking problem that uh, a lot of Honda riders had complained about in earlier CRs. Interestingly, the CR500 is still using an 18-inch rim at this point. Um, the KX500 and pretty much every other motocross bike in existence uh, was moving to like a 19-inch or already had moved to a 19-inch rear wheel. Uh, but Honda kept the 18 on the big 500. Uh, I think that probably helped the bike hook up a little bit and uh, probably helped the suspension a little bit as well. And it wasn't like people were racing Supercross on these things, so I don't think the lack of a 19 was a big hindrance in terms of the overall performance. Here for 1996, we get a return to the more Honda traditional look uh, with the deletion of all the purple, uh, certainly a more subtle look. Uh, overall, I'd say for 1996, uh, they thankfully were still upgrading the suspension on the CR500. You'll see basically there's not a lot of being done as far as the motor goes from year to year or the chassis at this point. Uh, that was kind of much set in stone, but Honda was upgrading the suspension when the CR250 would get the suspension upgrades. The 500 usually would get it as well. And for 1996, you get a switch from the 43 millimeter forks to the all new larger 46 millimeter inverted Kiaba forks. Uh, this new fork had a larger cartridge inside it, and Honda said that would improve damping control in rough track conditions. Uh, you get the uh, new shock as well that features high and low speed uh, compression damping adjusters, which is pretty trick stuff in 1996, kind of stuff you'd see on a works bike prior to this. Um, you also have an upgrade to the bearings in the shock to uh, be a little easier for maintenance. Um, the air cleaner element has a longer locating pin. You know you're really scratching the bottom of the barrel when you're highlighted on your new features is the longer locating pin. Although that is a real nice thing because nothing is more frustrating than trying to get that damn pin to lock in there and uh, make sure that you got your air filter on properly. Uh, you also get silver colored handlebars, which were still steel at this point in 1996, and a change from the red to the white number plates. So that can tell you right there. Aside from the new shock and forks, there really isn't much change. Uh, the graphics, of course, but other than that, the bike is uh, not a whole lot different than it was in 1995. 
Here for 1997, we get no mechanical updates uh, on the CR500. It was completely the same bike as it was in 1996. The only changes are some subtle uh, changes in terms of the graphics uh, visually and the plastic color. Uh, you get a white fender in the rear, which actually I think looks really uh, good on this bodywork. This is one of my favorite looks in terms of the 90s CR500s. I really liked the return of the iconic Honda wing to the shroud. I think the overall graphics here in 1997 were really great looking. Uh, some years... The, the stuff that you find on the smaller bikes don't really work on the old body work, but I think this works pretty well. The graphics don't look out of place um, on this old body work. Uh, the big CR on the seat I thought was pretty cool this year, and the overall graphic treatment was pretty nice, I think. And this is definitely a good-looking motorcycle, if a slightly old one. 1998 is another year of purely graphical updates. Uh, I still think it looks pretty good, though, this year. I think overall the 97 looked a little cleaner. The white rear fender with the right side panels, I think just having it monochromatic kind of makes it flow a little better. But uh, this year they switched back to the red rear fender. It doesn't look terrible, but um, I will say I think the 97 look was a little bit better. Uh, the seat being red last year I think was a little cleaner too as well. But um, certainly the 98 has a lot of aficionados. Not a bad looking bike by any means. Still has really good looking graphic treatment. I love that they kept the Honda wing on it. Uh, overall, good-looking motorcycle, I'd say, but I do prefer the 97 look slightly to this 1998 overall appearance. For 1999, the CR500 was back once again with only minor graphical updates. Uh, the bike basically looks exactly the same as 1998, although I will say I do not like the 99 graphics. Uh, never did, actually. I had a 99 CR125 brand new this year. I didn't really like it on the 125. Uh, I don't really like it on the 500. It's just, to me, it's not as good looking as when it had the yellow wing on there. I really much prefer the 97 and 98 look to this. Um, other than that, though, the bike basically is really unchanged. There's not a whole lot going on here. Now, it is worth noting that at this point, the 500 class was kind of going through a major transition in that uh, the Yamaha YZ400F had come out in, a year earlier than this in 98 and quickly was revitalizing the 500s. In, uh, in spite of the fact that there was the movement to four strokes. Uh, throughout the 90s, of course, you'd have Husqvarna's, Husabergs, and some other uh, kind of quirky offbeat brands building four strokes, but they didn't break through with the mainstream appeal that uh, Yamaha had with the YZ400F, and that really brought um, people back to the big bikes. I bought a YZ400F when they first came out, and I loved it in spite of the fact that it was very heavy. It really was a kinder, gentler open bike. Uh, didn't have nearly the power, especially the 400F, uh, the first version did not have nearly the power of a, like a CR500. It was uh, took a few years really until the 450F came out where they were a little bit more on par with what the 500s are putting out. The first YZ400 was pretty mellow, but um, basically it got people back thinking, you know, it's not, it wasn't, the inherent problem wasn't with the big motor in the 500s. Uh, you know, people like big powerful engines, but um, they were just a little bit kind of brutish and hard to ride. And uh, the, the popularity of the four strokes certainly has shown that people aren't afraid to ride big motorcycles. They just want uh, big motorcycles that don't try to slam them into the ground all the time. And that was something that some of these uh, 500s were notorious for. So for 99, it is notable that at least Honda's still building it. You know, Kawasaki and Honda still had their 500s in 99. Uh, but the new wave of four strokes really were kind of starting to transform people's uh, thoughts on the future of the class. For 2000, we get another graphical update on the CR500. Uh, through most of the early part of the decade, you know, Honda was giving the updated suspension components to the 500, but uh, at this point, the bike is kind of stuck in a time capsule, and really all they're doing every year is updating the appearance slightly to at least sort of coincide with what was on the smaller machines. Uh, this year in 2000, we get a significant uh, update to the 250 and 125. You get the second generation of the aluminum frame, couple of really good looking motorcycles in my opinion. Um, I love the looks of these bikes back then. I still think they look great now. Uh, the 500 does get the new color scheme. It's a slightly less deep red, more orangey red, more not quite the same as what they were running in like 1991 and 90, but more close to that than what the 99 color was, which was much more of a, a straight up kind of a flow uh, dark red. I do like the change back to the red seat here in 2000 and the graphics look pretty good, although uh, they work a lot better on the smaller bike. It's one of these things where clearly the graphics were designed for a totally different set of bodywork, and they don't look quite right, I don't think, on the shroud here. It's kind of like uh, sticking something on where it doesn't really belong. But overall, it's a good-looking motorcycle. Kind of harkens back to the look of the 92, really, actually, if you look at it. Aside from the, uh, the slightly sh different shade of uh, plastic, it doesn't look a whole lot different than the earlier 90s models. 
Um, good looking motorcycle overall still, uh, but obviously it's coming to the end of the line here for the Mighty CR500. All right, so we've come to the last year of the CR500R. Um, I would love to say that Honda threw the kitchen sink at the machine for one last hurrah here, uh, but unfortunately all they did was move the CR logo from the shroud to the seat. With the all-new CRF450R on the horizon, it was time for the uh, once baddest machine in motocross to be put out to pasture here in 2001. Um, this is still a mighty fast machine. You know, obviously, it's a very collectible machine now if you have a really clean... 2001 CR500, you have a jewel worth keeping. Uh, the bike, obviously, very much, you know, refined and mellowed compared to the mid-80s beasts that they were. Uh, the changes they made in the early 90s and then tweaks to the motor over time had really mellowed it out. This bike is not nearly as violent to ride as some of the earlier ones were, uh, but it's still a machine you had to respect. And uh, by this point, like I said, the world was moving kind of to four strokes. You had the YZ426 by this point. And then, of course, Honda coming out with their own CRF the year later would really transition the uh, open class pretty much to a full four-stroke class pretty quickly. Kawasaki, I think, kept their 500 for another two years. I think 03 was the last year for the KX500. So uh, the writing was on the wall, though, for these big two-strokes, unfortunately. Um, I'm sure if they still built one now, there'd be, you know, a lot of kooks out there buying them in small numbers. But... Uh, most people at this point would probably, if you ask them realistically, the, the four stroke is obviously a way better racing bike, but you can't beat the sound and the fury and just the feel of these machines. They're a lot of fun. If you've ever ridden a 500, it's certainly an experience. And uh, if you ever have an opportunity to do that, I would definitely recommend it. They are definitely unique machines that, uh, are, are really something to be experienced to be sure. Uh, so the uh, goodbye to the CR 500 R it was a great machine for its life and it is sorely missed to this day, I would say. So there you have it. That's a look back at the history of Honda's two-stroke open class machines. Uh, bikes that were certainly uh, well-loved many years, uh, feared other years. They had some up and down years, particularly in the early 80s. Um, they were some really poor machines, some really great machines mixed in there. I always loved two-stroke 500s. I've had several of them myself, although they they half I love them, half I hate them because they frighten the crap out of me. <laughs> uh, you know, modern four-strokes certainly much uh, much easier to control horsepower wise they have similar power but these even these old, old two-stroke 500s they still have them on torque and the, the thing that makes them so scary is the power comes on so suddenly and it they can get away from you pretty quick but man nothing sounds as good as a 500 and i gotta be honest uh, watching the the pros race these things back in the day there was nothing like watching a guy like jeff stanton or rick johnson just put the coals to these big bikes they were so awesome and i just marveled at the skill that was necessary to ride something so powerful so hard and so gracefully they're just awesome machines, and I miss I miss them being out there, but of course, you know, I'm an old guy, so <laughs> a bit of nostalgia there. Uh, so if you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. If you can share, subscribe, uh, let your friends know on social media, I would very much appreciate it. It helps grow the channel. And until we meet again, this is Tony Blaze with Motocross Vault. Keep your upper side down. Peace. <laughs>